Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's good to have you here for our session on uh, the impact of universal donor cells and iPSC on the cell uh, therapy industry. Uh, today we're going to explore uh, with our panel of experts, we'll be exploring uh, what, what is the, what's behind the use of universal cells. And we'd like to, I'd like to frame the conversation by um, just asking you to think about three categories uh, for the panel. Category of quality, category of cost, and a category of scalability. Now, we're in an age where we, st actually when the industry first started to get quite popular a number of years ago, large cell banking was the way to go because it looked more like traditional pharma than did patient-specific cell therapies. Um, but the fact that it looked better didn't stop the patient-specific cell therapies from advancing in terms of finding um, real potential for cures and showing the real potential for cures. And now that we're there and showing real proof of concept in patients that are getting better using these cells, there is a move to try to address some of the issues around patient-specific cell therapy manufacturing by moving into large cell banking or universal cells. So when we look at the characteristics of quality, cost, and scalability, um, we have to think about the great potential that we've got in cell banks used for the treatment of a variety of different diseases and true regenerative potential, in addition to high-throughput drug discovery platforms, safety pharmacology, gene-based editing, um, high-throughput omics methodologies, uh, and the like. Uh, but we're asking questions around the quality attributes for a good, say, IPSC, what makes a good one. And the, the issues that we've been ch challenged with are those around differentiation potential, epigenetic status, tumorigenic and immunogenic potential, maturation changes, batch-to-batch -batch variability, co-occurrence of heterogeneous populations, and practical considerations around cell sourcing. Where do the cells come from, and how does that make a difference in the final cell products? So now that we've completely depressed you about the use of universal cells, I thought it would be time to let the panel introduce themselves, tell you where they're coming from on this issue, how they're addressing, how they are attempting to address uh, the issue, and then we'll get into those three characteristics of uh, quality, cost, and scalability. Thank you. Tim? Yeah, good afternoon. So my name's Tim Liu. I'm the CEO at Senti Biosciences. Uh, so Senti's a synthetic biology company. We really focus on programming uh, functionality into cell and gene therapy products. And so for us, the, I think the, the thing to think about with universal donor cells and iPSCs is um, we're primarily users of these products. We like to think of them as delivery vehicles or carriers for some of the genetic programs that we're trying to deliver into patients. Uh, there's a couple advantages that we, we, we we're excited about um, with, with these sort of cells, being able to do genetic engineering uh, and have it potentially be done at a clonal level so we can deal with uh, more narrowly defined and performing circuits that are not necessarily heterogeneous over a primary cell population. Uh, it's the ability to actually get in there and sequence and confirm that the product is working well and create master cell banks that you can then validate and, and take forward into the clinic. And I think the opportunity that we're excited about most particularly then is if you have this carrier that you can actually use in, in across multiple patients, what are the types of functionalities that you, know, you might want to program in? What, what can the gene circuits and synthetic biology do for you? So what about genetic switches or, or kill switches that you might need in these products so you could up or down regulate their activity after they've gone in vivo? If we have cells that can persist for a long time in vivo, then you actually start even thinking about chronic diseases that you may be able to address with these systems. You know, cells that we can program to sense and respond to disease, you know, only turn on when a particular flare is happening. And so those are the types of things that uh, we're particularly excited about at Senti. Um, we're building the, the genetic tools to really enable that control of, of a cell product and hopefully working with you know, other pioneers in the space who are developing those universal cells and iPSCs as, as, as vehicles for carrying these into patients. I'm Stuart Abbott. Uh, titles and company are up on the screen. Um, Adaset is a CAR T cell company, um, but we're actually an allogeneic uh, CAR T cell company uh, working on gamma delta T cells. The, uh, not an IPSC derived allo, but actually a healthy donor derived allo product. Um, we focus predominantly on that healthy donor derived material um, from a quality perspective, but actually quality as it uh, relates to consistency. So batch after batch from healthy donors, we find that we can create consistent product. We can characterize that product very carefully 
um, and that allows us to understand better understand critical to quality attributes, how they may be applied, etc. Um, the gamma delta side of this is fundamentally because there's less engineering to do with the gamma delta T cell than there is with an alpha beta T cell if you're going to use it in an allogeneic setting. Um, there are lots of different modifications that you have to make to an alpha beta T cell to allow it to be used in an allo setting. Many, many of those are not required in gamma delta T cells, and they happen to have some quite profound anti-tumor activity as well. Um, the cost of production, the um, sort of scalability, they're kind of linked. Um, you know, we have, I think all of us are working on, you know, allo products of some description. They're larger scale batch manufacture. Um, we're not, you know, creating a service on a per patient basis, but actually a product where any given batch of product can be used to dose, you know, multiple tens, hundreds, potentially thousands of patients. Um, the ultimate scalability is still to be figured out. Um, you know, we'll, we'll probably all say that we've got scalable processes, but really until we have human data on knowing what the safe and effective dose is, we don't know whether we're generating 10 doses, 100 doses, 1,000 doses, 10,000 doses. And we've seen in the field that, you know, claims that, you know, a single CAR T cell can actually eradicate tumor. Well, you end up with a lot of drug product if you're making two times 10 to the 11 cells, and each one of those cells can treat a patient. We're not there, but there's a relationship between effective dose and scale that we need to, uh, we will discuss over the course of the afternoon. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. So, Dan Shoemaker, uh, CSO of Pate Therapeutics. Uh, we're focused on generating IPS derived NK and T cells for uh, mainly uh, cancer <coughs> indications. Uh, we have three cleared INDs um, with IPS derived NK cells. Um, we're big believers in. Um, master cell banks that could be you know, highly characterized where you can make that investment a single time and then have that serve as a renewable source for running many manufacturing campaigns. You know, scalability, cost, reproducibility um, are all big things. Crowd preservation and, and, and you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to freeze the NK cells in, 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 an infu in a crowd media that's uh, infusion ready such that at the, at the site of the patient interface it's really and simplified and, and um, yeah, and so we're in, in the clinic now and uh, I'll be giving a talk at 515 and go into a few more of the programs and details there. But um, again, one of the nice things was starting off with NK cells, it's sort of their custom fit for this allogeneic applications where almost a mismatched cell performs um, better and, and um, uh, due to the cure mismatching um, and yeah, so it's an exciting time and, and we've been doing this for 10 years and it's, it's really satisfying to see um, the IND starting to clear and getting into the clinic, so. Thanks. So good afternoon everybody, Alza Zam, I'm the CEO of Team Unity, a T-cell engineering company based out of Philadelphia. Uh, I'm probably the outlier on the panel because I know very little about IPSCs and allogeneic platforms. Most of what I learned came from working with this guy who taught me a lot about IPSCs and HSCs when we work together in a former life. Um, but I come from the world of clearly um, disproportionately focusing on solid tumors with T cell CARs and TCRs, um, but clearly looking very closely at all my colleagues who are developing modalities with NK cells and allogeneic platforms. Uh, we have early research efforts in the allogeneic space. We're developing a tandem product uh, for acute myeloid leukemia now, which isn't your typical off the shelf low cost of good kind of products. I can talk about it at some point later on. So I think I'm gonna be the outlier here and be a bit of a contrarian. <laughs> we'll count on you to be the contrarian. <laughs> so Bastiano Sanna, CEO and president at Sema Therapeutics. We are a stem cell company uh, focusing on uh, type one diabetes. We use uh, uh, all sort of uh, stem cell as a, we call it like a starting base for our product. Our product is the uh, pancreatic islet, you know, beta, alpha, and delta cells. So we currently working on uh, embryonic stem cells. Uh, we also working on uh, uh, non-genetically modified iPACs, and we working on genetically modified iPACs. So and we uh, kind of run the range of, uh, of starting materials. Um, I think each one of them has uh, their unique challenges and, and, and benefits, and uh, uh, I don't think there is a perfect um, material or source of, of material for, uh, for uh, the product. I think that uh, um, 
when it comes to large indications like type 1 diabetes, I think scalability and uh, uh, the ability of consistently producing large amount of cells is uh, the final product. I think is more important than whatever starting material you, you can use. Uh, I think one important point on the uh, universal uh, donor cells, but also in just in general starting material, I don't think anybody's thinking of using IPACs as therapeutic. Uh, we all use them to make something else. So one of the things I always wonder is uh, why at least uh, uh, in the initial phases in kind of the general biology of, uh, of those cells, we cannot find a non-competitive space when some of the questions can be, can be asked and, uh, and, and, and worked on collaboratively. All right, thank you. So, so Oz, maybe since um, you are, in a way, because you're focused on more patient-specific autologous cells now, we could start out by, if you could just frame us, you know, we, we all know the success these cells are seeing in that category has been very successful. And you're, you're now advancing that to a solid tumor, as you said. But the question is, what's the, what are the quality challenges that you face um, right now with a patient-specific cell therapy? And then I would ask the other speakers to respond how they think universal cell, a large cell bank, whether it's a universal cell or just an allogeneic cell bank, would address those challenges. Sure, happy to, to take a stab at that. So look, if, if I think about the experiences we've had as a young company, really going into the solid tumor space, going in with gene edited platforms in TCR land, uh, looking at solid tumors. Um, I mean, the, the, the first big thing I'll underscore is uh, analytical development. I mean, that's the big lesson I've learned as I've sort of traversed coming from the CD19 and BCMA world into to moving to where, where as a company we are now. I mean, clearly analytical development is important across cell therapies and gene therapies, but but the need to really be ahead of the curve on that in the settings of what we're looking at and then thinking if we, if we are gonna to move to Allo, which clearly I think in the future the world will be moving, the puck is moving that clearly in terms of scalable platforms with radically reduced cost of goods and it will get there. But I think some of the fundamentals that we're applying in the autologous setting in, in certainly the areas we're in are easily gonna be extrapolatable to, to the, the colleagues here. Um, I mean, to give you some, some more cogent examples, um, working with colleagues at Penn, we were the first to dose patients with a CRISPR-based TCR product in the US. And that was a triple edited product where we attempted to avoid the mismatch of a new TCR with the endogenous TCR by knocking out the alpha chain and the beta chain with CRISPR guides. And then we took out PD-1 as well. So quite a heroic attempt at overcoming immunosuppression as well. And that IND to me felt like doing the BLA of Kim Raya three times over. Seriously, <laughs> when I think about the, the questions that came back, the, the, the amount of requirements from a safety perspective, but also analytical development perspective. So I think that component is gonna be something that uh, companies are working hard at. Uh, talent is there, but talent is scarce as well <laughs> in terms of folks who really, really understand analytical development. So that's an area I certainly place a disproportionate focus when I think about the future and the capabilities that a company like ours requires. Um, and then the lessons learned from you know, the cell sourcing. Um, in our world currently, the patient is the source. Uh, but then you start to think about um, those sources of cells for allogeneic or IPSC platforms. Um, some have a favor for a super donor. Um, I talked to many colleagues who, who um, you know, colleagues from Beta Match and other source providers that, that shy away from, from that kind of approach. Are we looking at a master cell bank? Are we looking at a universal cell, as was pointed out? These are areas where all of the above, as I can see, are whole spectrums available for us before we even get into IPSCs and K cells and, and specific cell types. But I think those, those two things uh, are clearly very important uh, as I think about quality and attributes required for CQAs for products that we're developing that I think clearly have implications because, you know, my feeling is when we look at the allogeneic space, uh, there's a disproportionate focus on the editing piece and we don't talk enough about the upfront manufacturing requirements and the downstream analytical testing. And clearly we're focused on an appropriate, so where the value is gonna come for these products longer term, but there's a lot more work we still need to do on fundamentals and analytical development is one area that I, I, we've made progress with, but it's an area of risk for us. So some food for thought there on, on from my perspective.
So before we get to the analytical development piece, Bastiano, you've made a comment that the final product is more important than the starting material. Um, in the, and Oz's point is in the patient-specific cell therapy, the starting material is always slightly different to one another. It's going back to the right. same patient. Um, but, but how can it be that a cell source doesn't affect the final product? Or, or is that not what you're saying? I mean, it does to, to a point, though, right? Uh, we know that there are different uh, uh, predispositions in terms of uh, where uh, a stem cell can go, uh, in terms of uh, ability of making particular cell types. There are differences in the cell lines. Certain cell lines are more predisposed toward a certain type or, or not. So there is, uh, uh, it's not completely indifferent, you know, the, the, the starting material. But um, it's just another, it's just another raw material for us. You know, the, the way we think about the the, the stem cells. Um, I'm more interested in understanding how we can uh, make a product out of those cell lines. I think we all now working on a universal donor cell. You know, from what I hear about what the company is doing, I think we are all thinking about the same molecules to either cut in or cut uh, cut out. Uh, I think we're all probably thinking along the same lines. Um, I, haven't, I haven't heard uh, as robust of a discussion on the analytics. How are we going to be sure that these cells are actually universal? I don't think there is a consensus there. I, uh, I think these are common problems that mm -hmm. independently of what we're going to do with the cells, we all have to deal with. Uh, so th that, that was the kind of the, the sense of what I was saying, that uh, um, my product is beta cells. Uh, whether I make them uh, out of uh, embryonic, uh, induced pluripotent, or uh, uh, genetic modified um, is almost agnostic. We, in our lab, for example, we end up with the same beta cell uh, regardless of where we start. There are certain tweaks you need to make, but the, the final product is the same. Well, but that's the point, though. So you have analytics capable of determining that you're ending up with a final product that's the same. Right. right. That's a big statement, huh? Uh, well, it's just that uh, what is lacking, though, uh, is the analytic, when it comes to universal donor cells, is like, is this cell truly uh, universal? It's truly invisible ah. to the immune system? And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, I don't think anybody has figured that out in terms of uh, preclinical models. And uh, as a practitioner, practitioner of the field, even the, the idea that the first thing, the first time you really know if you worked or not, isn't a human being is a little, <laughs> is a little scary. Dan, do you have a comment about that? Um, this is a tough question, but I, I do. So we're starting on the other end of the spectrum where we only expect our cell to persist for a week, and we're really pursuing multi-dosing strategies. And, and How many doses? Uh, the current. Um, trial that we're running now, each patient receives a, a lympho conditioning, so, so very gentle conditioning, and then six doses okay. of an allogeneic IPS drive, mm -hmm. non-engineered NK cell. Okay. And so we really are focused on clinical learnings, because before we jumped on and started engineering in stealth, we wanted to make sure we, re we firmly understood the problem that we're trying to avoid. So we're very interested in understanding is the properties of the sixth dose identical to the properties of the first dose with respect to persistence and you know, what exactly is it more T-cell mediated or B-cell mediated rejection? Um, and then once we clearly frame this in a clinical setting, I think that's when we could reach into the toolbox and just say, what's the best tool for this? This is the exact problem that we're up against. And, and whether or not it's, it's doing a second round of conditioning halfway through the cycle to suppress the, the, the patient's uh, immune system, whether or not um, it's using a second donor for the, the second three doses to, to, you know, to stay ahead of the building immunogenicity. Um, so these are all strategies that we're evaluating, but we wanted to make really sure that we're solving real world, real world problems because the preclinical models that we have to work with are really not sufficient. So we are trying to make the most of every patient in this clinical trial and really um, you know, define the problem such that we can then reach for the best tool to, to solve it. And how much energy are you putting into that analytical development piece, um, and, where, and where is that focused? Yeah, quite a, quite a bit, and, and it's nice being in the clinic now and having access to serial blood samples, cytokines, really looking at um, everything that we could get our hands on and measure uh, and trying to align it with the clinical outcomes is, is we're spending significant resources um, 
uh, on this in this early phase of introducing this new paradigm of IPS, you know, NK therapies. Mm -hmm. Well, for us, it's about choice. Um, when you're looking at allogeneic therapy, whether it's a healthy donor-derived derived product or whether it's an IPSC or an ES-derived product, the, the difference between those products and the patient-derived product is choice to make, choice to manufacture or not. In patient-derived products, you've got no choice but to make, manufacture the product from those patient materials. When you have healthy donor-derived products or IPSC <coughs> lines or ES lines, you have the choice to make the product or not make the product. Um, you can screen the donors, you can screen the IPSC lines. If the IPSC lines don't meet to specific criteria or the donor, healthy donors don't meet to specific criteria, you don't have to make the product. Uh, and therefore you can select um, particular attributes that are attractive to your product by selecting particular donors. Our experience is actually slightly different to, to Bastiana's. We, we actually find even within healthy donors, there are quite big differences in the end product that you make from different healthy donors, and that's despite locking the process, uh, ensuring that every process step is the same for every donor, we can end up with different drug products based on differences in the, the starting material, the donor, albeit all of those donors are healthy between X age and Y age, CMV negative, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that choice is important. When it comes to analytics, um, it's, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. We, we, we'd have to have analytics in order to you know, good analytics in order to figure out what's a good donor from a bad donor, what's going to make good product versus bad donor, a bad product. But there's also the possibility of empty resolution. So we can, as a field, you know, do hugely you know, sensitive proteomic, transcriptional profiling, genomic profiling, and with any, with, between any two cells in a cell population, we can find differences. I could take a clonal cell line, I can guarantee you will find differences if you look hard enough at those cells. Um, there are a number of IPSC lines. They have mutations, et cetera. Um, is it relevant? Probably not. Can you see it if you look hard enough? Absolutely. And so the, 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 the trick to the analytics is you, making sure that you can actually interpret the results. Um, that when you're measuring a parameter, and we measure lots and lots and lots of parameters in our donors, only a few of those parameters actually have any impact on the final product. And so understanding that relationship between what you're measuring and how you're going to interpret it and what choices you're going to make is critically important. And I think there is the possibility to having empty resolution in some of those analyses. And ultimately it's about what you see in the clinical setting, right? Absolutely, yeah. That, that's, yeah. that's where... The correlation. And that's the exciting bit about the field now. So many companies are progressing INDs and getting into the clinic, right? So the in vitro, in vivo analytical components aside, it's the clinical correlates that we really, really need, because then I do agree with your point there, that it, it, you can, there's a trough you can reach in terms of single cell analysis, and you're going to find some variation, right? But at the end of the day, it's translating it into the clinic and how your analytical development really spots what needs to happen there. Yeah. Um, and then as you start to think about dosing patients, I mean, the challenge that I see, you know, and I'm speaking very from a solid tumor perspective, I need products that are going to be persistent and durable. And for the allogeneic world, that's an area where we're still figuring that out, right? Transitory products, can they persist? Do we need to do repeat dosing? How does that, how do you think about COGS? How are you thinking about, you know, the commercial scallop? These are all the things that are the real rubber meeting the road now as we start to dose more and more patients. It's an exciting time, but it's also opening up more questions for us that we've got to now start to get ahead of if we really want to realize the vision of these products moving forward. Do you think we have the tools now I don't know if you want to take a shot at yeah, this, maybe. But do we have the tools to um, analyze the manufacturing data that we're getting, either final product quality or CQA, CQAs, um, and then correlate that to patient outcomes? Are we even at the point we're scratching the surface on that? I mean, some of them might be a little bit easier, like you know, Bastiano, if they don't need insulin, it's great. <laughs> right? That's it's a pretty binary, but it probably won't look like that, right? Right. right, but uh, again, in, in, a, in, a, in a cell cloud that you can measure uh, many things. I think the problem we are all having is like yeah. what is relevant and what is actually correlate to yeah. uh, clinical outcomes. You know, we, we have a good biomarker is insulin, but there's many different things we want to be sure in terms of the quality attributes before we release a product or how we actually develop the process. 
uh, the problem is always like uh, what do you measure, what, what is irrelevant, what is predictive of, uh, of anything and what is just, uh, I'm not saying noise, but uh, uh, just things you can measure. But it's a numbers game, isn't it? It's again back to clinical data. I mean, what's our clinical correlates now? It's CD19, predominantly, right? I'm really excited and looking forward to now BCMA products coming to market. That's the next wave that we're going to start to get correlates for. Uh, but our, our knowledge base is really going to be around clinical correlates and hematological malignancies. That's going to help. But then me looking at Solitume as it's a different space, very, very early days to answer your question. Very unsophisticated at this stage in my mind because the, the clinical data is not generated enough numbers for us to be able to extrapolate and look back and say, does that clinical yeah. um, you know, correlate make sense now as I look back at my manufactured product and upstream CQAs? Uh, but I, I think that the, the tools are there, but it's the denominator of patient numbers that we now crave to be able to make sense of this and convince regulators as well, right? So, yeah, so prior to um, the age of uh, sort of widespread use of genetic manipulation of cells that are then used in therapy, it was much more difficult to determine the quality of the final product in terms of its potency. Sure. It's a little bit easier, maybe you can address that, Tim. It's a little easier once you're playing around with genetic manipulation, at least to say you've done what you said you were going to do. Right. I think, so, yeah, so I think you, you can at least define functionally that you're, the thing you've inserted has that function. Um, whether or not that's the, the minimum set for a, a, a good product, you know, is a question. Whether, you know, if you're relying on cells that can home into tumors or, you know, persist in tumors outside of what your gene circuit does, for example, your genetic element, there's, I think, some additional characterization that the cells are, you know, not simply just, you know, inert vehicles, right? They, they do other things. So being able to sort of correlate not just um, what you've inserted into the cell, but some of the key parameters of what the cell does in addition to that is still, I think, a challenge because we don't have some of that clinical data um, available. One of the nice things, though, about being able to have you know, master cells, or universal donor cells, is that at least for the insertions that you're putting in, um, you can be much more defined and characterize those before we deliver them into patients. So we can get you know, bet much better resolution as to did this donor transduce with this you know, genetic element did it actually function to a particular spec that I defined? Um, and actually, there's some additional benefits in that we can be much more precise as to where we insert, how many copies that we're screening for, to really make sure that we're in a, a given therapeutic range or, or uh, that we set for ourselves. I think that's one of the potential great impacts on the space is just really being able to get sort of a more uniform population of cells so that when we start generating that clinical data, we can go back and hopefully correlate to a more uniform population of starting material. One of the efforts that ARM uh, is launching is the effort on the aging project, which is looking at setting standards for this sort of thing, uh, based on the AMAB efforts of the biologics industry and how well that helps set standards for the beginnings of the biologics industry. Uh, are we at a point now where when you're starting to do uh, gene editing of any type, whether it's vector or non-vector based, that there's a standard that you're looking for um, on that transduction, transduction efficiency, or, yeah. <laughs> or uh, you know, off targets, or anything like that. Is there? Are we anywhere near that? I think there's there? increasing guidance from the FDA and from the field as to you know what some of those targets are, not to exceed a certain vector copy number, and and trying to. But I think so a lot of this is being increasingly defined um, as we get more and more sophisticated modifications. So if we're talking about three edits, five edits, even more, this question of you know what's what's the appropriate level of tolerability. I think. It's, in my mind, it's not really clear whether it's 0.01%, 0.001%, et cetera. Similarly, if we're tar starting to talk about genetic elements that actually have some dynamics associated with them, you know, this thing that's going to turn on or off by itself once it's going, gone, gone into a patient, um, that's a pretty new concept. You know, hasn't really been fully tested in, in humans yet to date. So I think we're, we're trying to do our best to define what we think are the right specs. It should be at this level and then be able to switch on to that level. Um, but whether or not that's acceptable and, and the level we need, you know, should we be able to tune it higher or lower? I think we're going to need more clinical experience before we know exactly how to set those metrics. And that will always be product specific. Probably. I think it will, yeah. 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 So it's not a standard. <laughs> and I think it's going to be hard to develop a standard yeah. because you're talking about the finished product before it's infused in man, right? Yeah. Six months later, nine months later, ten months later. That's back to your original point of clinical correlates, right? You know, if you have a PD-1 edited cell that's only, you know, swimming around after a year at 5%, is that enough? Don't know, right? It depends on the clinical correlate, right? So I think you're going to move past the analytical thinking of the finished product, but what is this really going to do in the clinic? 5% may be enough. It may not be. So I have no idea how we can set those standards at this time point, to be honest. 
Do you want to add something, Stuart? It looks I, like you do. No, I, I hate to agree. I mean, it's, um, you know, I'll qualify something I said earlier. I said, you know, what I fundamentally said was we, we can characterize starting material and we can make relationships to the finished product in terms of identity, purity, yield, potency in mice. Um, but I always made a very critical point, which is we don't actually have enough clinical data yet. We're pre preclinical stage companies, other companies are slightly further ahead, but as a field, we don't necessarily have enough clinical data um, to make those correlations. Um, now, at some point in time, hopefully, we'll make clinical correlation to preclinical data, to manufacturing data, to starting material. But the proof of the pudding, as it were, is actually in what does the product do when it gets into the relevant species, when it gets into man, and what effect does man or woman have on that product? Because it's a living dynamic product, and so even at the end of manufacture, it's, a you know, it's in a volatile state, it's in a dynamic state. That living drug can then change thereafter depending on what environment it finds itself in, whether it finds itself in a solid tumor with high levels of tgf beta, whether it finds itself in another solid tumor that happens to have high levels of canurinine, those cells are going to change. And so we're trying to really make some very, very complex um, relationships between what the cell looks like at the end of money, or sorry, what the cell looks like to start with, IPSC, healthy donor derived, et cetera, what it looks like at the end of manufacture, what it looks like after it's been in and out of a mouse or other, non, <clears throat> or other um, species, and then what it looks like after it's been in the human uh, and potentially out of the human if we harvest those materials. But we don't have the clinical data yet. So life is about trade-offs, and mm -hmm. sure. we are looking at uh, trading off um, in terms of scale. Uh, we're looking at trying to bring down costs, but without addressing the cost issue, let's try just to address the scale issue for a moment and then move into how that impacts the cost. Uh, when we look at scaling, um, first of all, what's the real scale we're talking about? I think I've heard numbers here today. The panelists have gone from 1,000 to 2 um, as the scale that we're looking at for these allogeneic products. Where are we right now with that? How big a batch is a batch? And with this very issue of analytics and not really being able to determine you know, how, how do we make these cells, how do we make sure that they're effective? The larger the batches get, the more the risk gets that you've created an entire batch for a lot of patients. So in a patient-specific setting where Oz is sitting, if you get one batch that doesn't quite hit it, that one patient doesn't benefit. But that scales out to 1,000 patients, it becomes a much more serious issue. So um, just touching on that issue a little bit, what scales are we at? Maybe, Dan, you can start. What scales are we at, and what's the trade-off on that, and how are we handling that? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the main advantages of an IPS platform is the ability for um, high scalability. And from a practical standpoint, we've settled on um, the 50 to 100 liter range, sort of at that final stage of the um, MK manufacturing. And one of the key limits is, is, is during the crowd preservation, where let's say we'll typically generate 300 doses in a, in a manufacturing campaign but just making sure that the first dose and the 300th dose are identical, and how long does it take as you go through the, the final you know, introduction of the cryo media and the control. So you're limiting the batch size based on one of the unit operations that takes too much time. And, and, and then that's also what, what do we need with respect to the phase one studies that we're about mm -hmm. to enroll. So I don't know that we'd know what to do with um, 3,000 doses <laughs> today. Um, and so it's a compromise of what do we need to run the, the, the studies that are ahead of us but have enough cells that we can contemplate things like let's give each patient six doses, you know, and not have that be a, a have that be feasible, have that be cost, per, you know, cost um, openness, and but at the same time, so we sort of landed on with the unlimited scalability of this IPS platform, we sort of have self-limited it to let's make 300 doses per manufacturing campaign, um, and it also um, so this is just where we've settled. But if we do want to look towards the future and say what would it look like to go to 3,000 or 10,000 doses? One of the nice things about this platform is that nothing really needs to fundamentally change. You have, you know, large, you go from 100 liters to 500 liters. You have more automation during the crowd preservation process. Um, and there's, other, there's a lot of people who figured that part of it out, but at least where we are is really innovating how do you do this end-to-end -end process under GMP conditions. Yeah, we, we sort of initially settled in the sort of 50 liter, 300 doses, uh, per manufacturing campaign is, is the sweet spot. So you're finding the cells don't have a sort of hay-flick limit type of limitation to how many times they can divide, how big the batch can get. I think you said unlimited. Does that Well, does that it's interesting because if you put a million iPSCs in 
and through a 44-day process, you'll get 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th NK cells out. Okay. And by that, you can sort of control the number of population doublings. And, and certainly, you want to keep an eye on that with respect to maintaining the genome stability and control of the manufacturing process. But in a certain sense, if you want a bigger run, you could just put more iPSCs on the front end and then more volume at the huh. back end. Mm -hmm. but, but certainly, it's not a thing where you can just sort of indefinitely expand this without at least keeping a careful eye on the genome stability of the product as it goes through the manufacturing process. Bastiano, how are you handling that with the embryonic stem cell? I mean, the scale-up is always, I guess, is a, of particular importance for us because type 1 diabetes is a, a large population, and uh, we aspire to have uh, the, our therapy applicable to as many patients as possible. We, f uh, we found that one of the biggest uh, biological challenges we had was going from uh, uh, 2D and to 3D type of uh, expansion. That was, uh, you know, this is some <coughs> fundamental biology that you need to understand and overcome there. Um, now we have uh, our cultures are in, in, in 3D in bioreactors, but, uh, and we're scaling up uh, as, uh, as appropriate. We don't want to, you know, spend a disproportionate amount of resources in uh, scaling up uh, uh, too early because, um, again, it, we are not a clinical company yet. So, the learnings that we're going to have uh, in the clinic, we want to be able to inform our process development in a, in a way that is not too complicated by large scale type of batches. So uh, we are doing the work that is necessary to kind of uh, be ready to scale up to large 50, 500 uh, liters type of bioreactors. But you don't want to lock that process too early because uh, then you, you, you'll have to redo the work in a way if you need to change a process slightly because of what you learn in, in the clinic. We found that every little change you make in the speed of the kind of uh, 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 rotor that uh, agitates okay. the cells, in the size, in the oxygenation, everything makes a difference. So uh, it's almost like trying to align the stars, and you don't want that to happen too, too early. What, what type of differences do you see? You're saying everything makes a difference. What is the? It does make a difference in terms of the yield, in terms of the percentage of different cell types in your final prep. Uh, it does uh, make, uh, you know, we, um, our final product is clusters of cells, you know, kind of like, you know, islets. Mm -hmm. The size of that cluster changes, which uh, makes a difference in terms of how then we, we have to treat those, those, those cells. So every, every little uh, change you do in the, in the conditions, uh, it, it does uh, make a difference in the final product. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I guess my, my point is that uh, when it comes to scaling up, you don't, you don't want to do it too quickly uh, uh, in terms of uh, optimizing yeah. everything just for yield or scale when you're still trying to work the final details uh, of, the, of the actual process. So you would be happy if you could get a batch big enough to do some some significant, whatever that means, amount of testing <laughs> and patience. Right. Which is exactly and what you And then later know, see how big you can make our, that Our budget. strategy is now we have the scale that is uh, appropriate to allow us to comfortably treat every single patient that we are planning to do in the clinical trials. Uh, but we are not rushing to commercial scale too early because we, we still sense. want to have enough room to change right. uh, the final product. You don't want to prematurely lock yeah. the process. Exactly, and that's one of the reasons why, for example, we choose to internalize uh, kind of a, a clinical GMP production in-house uh, as opposed to go, going for the CMOs. There's many now uh, out there that offer the service. We choose to internalize that uh, part of the, of, the, of the activities because uh, uh, it's such a, a crucial component of, uh, uh, of the product. Uh, how you manufacture it, and we want to have our process development lab literally next door to our GMP facility. Uh, so when we do the scale up and the process development is next door to where we're going to be manufacturing clinical uh, clinical products. That should make for some interesting regulatory conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's do it on um, on um, batch size, batch to batch variability, the like. Yeah, kind of sort of similar to, to Dan. I mean, mm -hmm. we're we're a little bit smaller, but probably slightly higher density cultures. So we're in the sort of five to ten liter scale as opposed to fifty to one hundred. 
Um, but it really depends on what your ultimate cell density is, whether you're running at a million cells per milliliter or you know, um, 10 million cells or 20 million cells per milliliter. Um, the downstream logistics of you know, um, fill finish are, are certainly important, and just certainly when we're dealing with DMSO-based cryoprotectants and the ability to hold the product for a limited period of time while we're doing that fill is you know, is critical. But it's an engineering challenge. It's just being you know, it's solved by filling into different container closure devices and, and having instruments that can fill those pretty quickly. But you know, the, the view that we've taken in terms of scalability is to have a platform that is scalable so that you know, we, if we need to go to 50 liters, we can go from 5 to 250, but not to go there in you know, first in human studies. Um, because we don't know, coming back to a point I made earlier, we don't know at what, right now what the effect of dose is. If we make a billion cells and the effect of dose happens to be a million cells, we're golden. We've made a lot of product. We made a lot of, you know, <clears throat> vials of product um, during that batch. But if we make a billion cells and we happen to find out that the effect of dose is a billion cells, then we've only made one drug product. You know, we've only made one dose. So um, you know, our approach is let's have the clinic inform us and let's make sure we're not boxing ourselves into a production process that isn't scalable if we need to scale in the future. Any um, impact on T cell subtype? With respect to this issue, yeah, it's a little bit. I mean, it's a little bit like Bastiano. I mean, there are a lot of different factors that uh, come into play. Um, you know, it's a dynamic system. You have different cell populations. Whether you're making NK, you know, whether you're predominantly making NK cells or you're predominantly making gamma delta T cells or alpha beta T cells, you're starting with material that's not completely sorted. You'll have some monocytes in there. You'll have B cells, etc. Mm -hmm. um, all of those. Excuse me. Should have put my phone off. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> um, you know, all of those other cell populations um, are having an impact on, on the culture. They, they secrete cytokine, they secrete mitogen, they gobble up cytokine and mitogen. Um, and so, yeah, those, those other cells make a difference. You've got to control for them. Uh, or, let's say, they can make a difference. And then you need to understand what the, the potential impact of those other cells are. When you're designing a gene editing yeah. technology yeah. to go after any one of these products that uses gene editing, um, what, what, what is the impact of the heterogeneity of the population, the batch size, all of that? Can you help? Yeah. Can you help us? Yeah. Well, so I have maybe two comments. One, certainly the more uniform the, the, the product can be, and the earlier you can go in that process, so you can characterize that early you know, master cell or iPSC, then it gives you sort of much greater homogeneity in the final product. If you're editing something later on, uh, where you're editing at the final product stage, then you have to deal with you know, issues around you know, can I get into all the cells that I need to get to? How do I characterize heterogeneity over cell population? Um, so I think that's a fundamental trade-off. Um, I think the other thing that I, I, I sort of, before you go, yeah. is it just distribution, uh, or is it is there anything cell specific? There's about also the biological differences, right, as you're going throughout the process of expansion. But are you directing in a heterogeneous population? Can you, and are you working on ways to direct the vectors? and other techniques to a specific cell type. To a specific cell type. Yeah, so we can, yeah, yeah so that's yeah. certainly possible if you want to have a genetic element that's only switched on in a certain subpopulation. So if you know you're going to get a heterogeneous population at the end, to only have a circuit that switches on in a certain state, mm -hmm. design promoters and things like that, that can sort of do that. Um, you can also potentially build genetic circuits that help guide that differentiation process along, for example, at, at a genetic level from a programmable director differentiation approach. Um, so yeah, I think those, those are possible with, with, with further sophistication in the gene editing um, and gene engineering side of things. Um, the other thing I'm just going to bring up is just hearing the, the, the topics here is there seems like a lot to be learned from um, other areas where people have dealt with this in the past. If you think about like in the metabolic engineering space where people typically spend most of their time dealing with cultures on the order of like 50 milliliters and then expect to be able to scale that to 50,000 liter bioreactors, I think there were a lot of failures early on in that space because the the model scale systems that we have in the lab or even in our PD labs doesn't translate as you scale up um, in terms of just the physical parameters of those systems. So I think that's an engineering problem, but really trying to build um, systems that are more convenient that we can use at the lab scale that are actually going to be reproducible or at least somewhat like we can expect how to scale um, to larger settings will be really useful versus trying to make that transition from 2D to 3D that typically seems to be really challenging for, for the space we work in now. So if there was just like a more convenient 3D format that you could work with in the lab, maybe you could around that from an engineering perspective. So Oz, other than the scale out issue that's obviously associated mm -hmm. with you know, manufacturing, wh wh how are you thinking about scale? 
So it's interesting. interesting. Listen to the guys here, right? I mean, the and appropriately so, they're focusing on that cell source, right, and that scale. And then um, just looking at where the field is right now and where I see the developments in the autologous space, hopefully that's going to lend support to the allogeneic IPSC field, right? So looking at every step of the process from selection, enrichment, transduction, harvesting, finished fill, all of these things, I mean, let's face it, they're drivers of cost at the end of the day. What's the biggest driver of cost? Back in 2012, 2013, it was uh, the boutique cottage industry of viral vectors, right? Look where we are now, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm having a nightmare just thinking back memory bank in 2013 <laughs> and doing deals with viral vector companies at the time. Um, but I think look at how much That's progress. That's no longer an issue? Well, it's still an issue, but it, we've come a long way. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the yields and efficiencies now of viral vectors, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's been a phenomenal growth. Mm -hmm. Um, and then clearly you've got the play for non-viral vector technologies yet to be proven clinically, but starting to get there. And then the people side of it is still going to be a factor. Whether you're an allergenic or autologous player, right? That's an element of cost of goods, and, and I agree with Bastiano's point. You can't model that in an early stage setting until you've really got into the clinic. So I'm kind of piecing the, the scale up from the liter batch size perspective of the upfront material, looking at the challenges my, my colleagues have here but then also seeing that they're not really going to be successful for the future vision without the autologous players now really committing and fixing the other components of scale. Um, and maybe the solutions are going to be somewhat different in terms of global shipment, et cetera, because an allergenic product and scale, if you can do that from one site. But I mean, that's uh, to be determined, right? So hopefully give you a flavor of how I'm trying to piece all of this together as I think of companies like ours that are firmly in the autologous space, but know that at some point in the future, Allergenics could be a reality if we get some successful wins with regulators in terms of potency assay development, in terms of analytical development, and thinking about, at the end of the day, the, the ultimate currency, which is success in the clinic, right? We're still just dipping our toe in the water there. Uh, but I think next three to five years, there's going to be uh, an amazing amount of data coming through. Admittedly, more in the heme malignancy space and the solid tumor space mm -hmm. to start with, but hey, it all helps, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the other, before we get into cost, one of the other trade-offs is the, um, of larger cell banking is the fear of tumorigenicity that can happen. Um, and so maybe I could just ask the panelists for a couple of minutes. We'll start with you, Bastiano, because embryonic stem cells have always had this aura about them. Um, how are you handling that issue? What's, what, is, what are you thinking about that? And well, the other you know, panelists want to I think the solution is always data, more data, more, uh, more studies, more characterization of your... Uh, of your product, more sensitivity in, uh, in, in your assays so, uh, is, is part of really developing that set of analytics that Oz was talking about, also really understanding each, each one of the cells that you have in your product. We all have heterogeneous cell population in our product. I don't think there is any cell therapy that is pure, mm -hmm. you know, in a way. Uh, I think is uh, the level of uh, sensitivity of your assays is the one that gives you comfort that you know exactly what you have in your, uh, in your prep. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, we have done is uh, also put, uh, uh, I, I, when it comes to tumor genes, in terms of tumor generating potential, to me is always kind of more of a, a numbers game than uh, uh, like a number of uh, experiments you can do is, uh, uh, since it's a, it's, a, it's a stochastic event, you know, whatever transformation you have, how many cells do you really need to go through uh, before you see an event, and uh, uh, what kind of event you see and how, how you deal with it. Um, I think there was a lot of anxiety years ago about embryonic stem cells. I don't think there is much of that anymore. Uh, at least that has been our uh, experience in, uh, in, in the conversation we have had with, um, with the agency. Um, we also have the benefit of, uh, if we want to, uh, sequestering the cells in a device that... Uh, how, how much of a difference does that make? I mean, it, it, would that allow you, in the extreme, would that allow you to put a higher percentage of tumorigenic cells into a product because they were in a device? If you, if you wanted to do that, right. <laughs> uh, I, I, look, I, 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 think, I think the field is, has evolved faster than our concerns. I think the, the concern about tumor potential was something that uh, was all the rage a few years ago, I think, uh, uh, has, has been surpassed, maybe, 
but um, feels it, like it. It's yeah. always, but again, is is a concern is always there, and it always uh, makes you kind of like uh, put extra effort in your assays. Uh, you know, having uh, having a, a more sensitive assay is, uh, it makes you much more comfortable going without advice, for example, than going 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 with it. So Let me ask Stuart, does the lack of an analytic event um, mean the lack of tumorigenicity? The lack of an oncogenic event? Well, the lack, the lack of a positive um, sign right, from an assay. Any? Well, they're, these are living drugs. Yeah. They're, they're going to change over time. I, I think the, you know, Bastian is correct. I mean, the, the general concern over tumorigenicity has decreased over years, um, or there's perhaps been more pragmatism that's come in, which is to realize that the animal models that we ordinarily would use to assess tumor genicity aren't particularly sensitive, and therefore you know, they're not really worth running. Um, but what, for whatever reason, the general concern has come down. I think there's one factor that may start to increase that concern, and that's the ability to modify cells to the point where they become invisible to the immune system. So we're talking about allogeneic cells, and, and you know, ordinarily, my cells to done, they would be rejected, whether they were normal or malignant, they would be rejected. However, if I edit my cells to now make them immune to, you know, immune to uh, NK attack, T cell attack, complement activation, et cetera, there's not a lot of ways that Dunn's body can clear my cells. And if anything goes wrong with those cells, at that point in time, it becomes rather a big issue. So I think we'll need to think carefully about the concept of tumor genicity in the era of um, en editing or engineering to, to yeah, think about sort of immune evasion. Or, or you have the immune system work as your uh, uh, safety switch. Yeah, safety yeah. switch. <laughs> you know, well, one, of our, one of our programs, the, the first one we're going to be putting in the clinic, will require the patients to assume chronic immunosuppressive therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the safety switches would be that uh, you just remove the immunosuppressive therapy and let the immune system do, do its work. And, and that's great for your application in an autoimmune disease, but it's not so great for the patients that have Right. right. Know, I, think, I think there's not the one solution for everybody. Yeah. 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 Right. But the tumor genistic question that you, had, you said a comment that I think was a good one in terms of have we or have regulators got over the hump? Yes, based on predominantly lentiviral technology or retroviral technology. Let's not forget if everyone's going to move into knock-ins and direct, you know, knocking things into track loci, et cetera. Uh, that's gonna be a different game, right? <laughs> so I think the jury's out with, the jury's okay for now because of where well, we are with, and I'm restricting my comments to T cell products, right? Uh, in terms of uh, viral vectors and the associated tumor genicity effect. But there's another brave new world coming around the corner, and for that, I don't know, you know, how the regulators are thinking. Yeah, I mean, that's where I think being able to program these cells with additional safeguards that are built in would be very powerful from our perspective. Um, none of these safeguards are going to be 100% also, so thinking about layering them on top and then it becomes a numbers game. If I'm infusing, you know, a billion cells and each safeguard gets me a window of 10 to the minus 6, then right. I may need two or three of these together. So it's, it's where that product profile, the dose that we're delivering, and then the performance of some of these safety switches um, it really comes together and you have to figure out what's the optimal technology to try to deal with that issue. But Dan, maybe you can kick us off on the last subject here, cost of goods. Um, is there really a cost of goods advantage here after everything we've just talked about, the additional testing perhaps, the additional risks, et cetera? W where is the cost of goods advantage? And, and please address this in the, in the context of um, value-based reimbursement and yeah. how much is cost really a problem in the current environment yeah. that we're in. So I think one, important thing that we focused on is separating the engineering and characterization and generation of a master cell bank that can then be used for many years as a renewable starting material for manufacturing. And the cost that you could, be, you could put into that initial setup fee, mm -hmm. the engineering um, is performed one time in the lifetime of a product. So I think that when we think about cost of goods and then when you go to run, do a manufacturing campaign, you'll take a single vial out of the master cell bank, do a manufacturing campaign, get 300 doses out, and then there's one calculation, which isn't totally fair, but it's what, what was the media and people requirements to do that manufacture, turn a, IP, a tube of iPSCs into 300 bags of NK cells. And the nice thing is like under this scenario, without even trying to optimize costs, you're already in the you know, thousands of dollars per, per dose. So, and so you can imagine how this is gonna, you know, when you scale, that this could scale in a favorable way, 
And again, the more doses you make, the more the cost of that initial you know, master cell bank generation and characterization gets, gets distributed over more ends, and this mm -hmm. becomes negligible at some point. So I think in, in the longer term, I think this is where I see hope as we go beyond the rare hematologic malignancies into the multiple myelomas where you have you know, tens of thousands and 30,000s and hopefully one day solid tumors where we now have hundreds of thousands. I, you know, a thing we take very seriously is like you have to have a process that's scalable and cost effective. It's just a general principle. So when we are successful, it will not wreck the pharmacoeconomic healthcare system. And so this is, there's a lot of um, obstacles and challenges of, of creating an IPS-based manufacturing, you know, genome stability, um, figuring out these multi-week differentiation protocols. But I think once you do figure that out, there is this sort of um, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that you, do, you, you, you are working towards a, a scalable and cost-effective Well, that's an interesting point, though, that, that we, we don't want to wreck the pharmacoeconomic system. But if it's a value-based reimbursement, what does it have to do with the cost? It does, it does if you're going to price it at yeah. something that's huge, <laughs> right? So that you can't ignore that equation, right, in terms of explaining value, radically reducing cost of goods, but stick a shock price at the same time, that ain't going to work, is it? Yeah, there was a comment this morning in the, the panel that was discussing sort of investor theses on <clears throat> novel technologies, and it was a simple statement that was made. And, you know, one of the things that rules out an opportunity for one of the investors was, does it cost more to make than you are going to get reasonably get in well, reimbursement? Well, yeah, that wouldn't <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, yes, cost yeah. is important, and yeah. then you've got... Yeah, things like so this is a crossover logic. point at some point. Right? Yeah. And the other thing that's nice is as you go to more complex gene editing, let's say track targeting and three or four other functionalities, so six, you know, six edits in a, in a map, the cost to characterize that and to generate that is, is in, in, incredible. And if you're doing this on a um, batch by batch basis or, God forbid, a dose by dose basis, that really becomes cost prohibitive as we think about more complex products. Whereas I think with the IPS approach, you, you, know, you do the editing once, you pick a clone, <coughs> and you've uncoupled that. The, the, the manufacturing is, is nearly identical, whether the IPS line has six edits or no edits. And so these are just simple principles that they seem trivial today, but I think as we move into more complex products, they're going to become much more meaningful. We'll say so, something from a regulatory perspective. There, there shouldn't be any reason in this day and age that we cannot substitute every serological assay for a nucleic acid-based assay. So the cost mm -hmm. of testing of the product, you know, these products, whether it's you know, on a patient-specific basis or even on sort of batch basis, um, when you're talking about sort of assays that require you know, in vitro analyses, the assays that require serological testing, some assays that even require in vivo testing, it's huge. And you know, arguably, the sensitivity of most of the, the nucleic acid-based tests that can substitute for those other tests is equal, if not better, and the cost is radically lower. And don't forget the cost of testing for a patient. I'm putting on an oncology hat here, right? So you're talking about product assay yeah. analytical development. Don't forget, you know, in the cancer space, it's the companion diagnostic piece, which is a real pain in the butt. Yeah. When you think about device exemptions and what you can do short term, but for scale, you have to think about those assays being available and tied in as part of the value story as well, right, is detecting those patients and continuing to monitor them as well. That's another piece that we go, won't go into today, but that's a As whole you think about dimension. moving to an ALA model to substitute your auto model, how many patients would have to be treated in a batch before it became more cost effective? Two doesn't do it, right? I mean, by Dan's math, it's not going to work. It's maybe five is a 10? Yeah. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> And, You're and the and only I, one doing autologous to. <laughs> yeah. And I also think that, that limiting ourselves due to cost to a single dose is, I think, in the near future, we're going to, if possible, the idea that giving multiple doses, especially like you were saying, with yeah. cells that are not indefinitely persistent, is going to be a game changer that is only enabled if the cost of goods are, are, are not tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars per dose. Okay. Right. Fair enough. Rochelle, you want to add anything? I think. Uh, it is so product dependent in that uh, I mean I've been uh, in my career I've worked on a few cell therapy products and each one of them had um, unique kind of like you know cost or uh, raw material challenges. Um, I guess you know to your question cost is I think what uh, uh, this the scaling to me is just more important than the starting material because uh, it's the scaling that really can save you. 
can save you on, on the cost. In terms of how, how much it costs now for do, to do like a destructive type of testing, uh, if you can go to uh, batch testing, that saves an enormous amount of money. Right. Also, the ability, even just simply uh, buying the, re the reagents in large quantities and bulk, it just saves a lot, uh, a lot more money than I actually care to, <laughs> to think about. Better buy the right ones. <laughs> exactly, and it, it, but by, uh, better buy a lot of them uh, if I had a place to store them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, well, we've reached the end of the hour, but I just wanted to make an opportunity. If there's anybody who had any question they'd like to ask the panel, just briefly give you a chance now to do that. Everybody wants coffee or something stronger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Uh, thanks to the speakers. <laughs>